Welcome to the third episode of A Guide to Australian Spiders. This will be the last of the introductory episodes. We'll be getting into the meat of the guide in subsequent videos. In the previous episode, we took a look at the external anatomy of a spider. Before that, we explored the relationships between spiders and other arthropods. In this video, I'll be revisiting phylogeny. When I covered the phylogeny of spiders in the first episode of the guide, I was focusing on their external phylogeny, which is how spiders are related to other organisms. This time, however, I'll be going over their internal phylogeny, which is the relationships within the group, so what the major types of spiders are and how they're related. I also feel like it'd be prudent to mention that this video may be hard to follow if you are unfamiliar with the basics of phylogeny. So if you haven't already, I would recommend watching the first episode of the guide before continuing with this video. Before I introduce you to the major groupings of spiders, let's first cover a few more terms that are of importance when it comes to discussing the relationships between the taxa. And yes, if you haven't noticed already, the words in this guide are bigger and scarier than any of the spiders I'll be covering. The first two terms worthy of mention are basal and derived, which are often used to describe both organisms and particular traits. I'll first cover its use in the context of organisms. Within a given clade, the taxon most distantly related to its other members is considered the most basal. Because basal taxa diverged earlier in time, as indicated by their more distant relationship, they may retain characteristics indicative of the clade's ancestral state. These are regarded as basal traits, traits which appeared early in a clade's evolution. Conversely, derived traits, known as apomorphies, are those that arose within a clade at a later point. An autapomorphy is an apomorphy that is unique to a single taxon, while a synapomorphy is an apomorphy that is shared by multiple taxa and is hypothesized to have evolved in their most recent common ancestor, and was subsequently inherited by all descendants of said ancestor. Because apomorphies are unique to a single clade or taxon, they can be used to distinguish them from other taxa. A primitive or ancestral characteristic is known as a plesiomorphy. For a given clade, any trait that emerged prior to its most recent common ancestor is plesiomorphic. A symplesiomorphy is a plesiomorphy shared by multiple taxa inherited via common ancestry in the same way as a synapomorphy. Plesiomorphies cannot be used to distinguish a particular clade from another, as such traits are not unique to said clade. Apomorphy and plesiomorphy are relative terms, and a single trait can be both depending on the clade of interest. For example, all centipedes possess modified legs known as forcipules, used to inject venom. And yes, I'm talking about centipedes in a spider video. Never underestimate my ability to bring up centipedes in a conversation, no matter the topic. Anyway, for centipedes as a whole, forcipules are synapomorphic, being shared by all members of the group and exclusively present in centipedes. So, one can use the presence of forcipules to distinguish centipedes from related groups such as millipedes. However, centipedes have diversified into numerous smaller groupings, from minuscule soil-dwelling lithobiomorphs to huge, powerful scolopendromorphs. For any of these particular groups, forcipules are plesiomorphic. Their presence alone cannot be used to distinguish any of the groups from one another, as all centipedes possess forcipules. Spiders comprise an order called the Araniae, which is basically what we finished on at the end of the guide's first episode. The Araniae are divided into two suborders, the Mesothelae and the Opisthothelae, 
so named because of the positions of their spinnerets. Now, let's take a closer look at the mesothelae. In these spiders, the spinnerets are located roughly toward the centre of the opisthosoma, which is where the suborder's name comes from, as the prefix meso means middle. Another characteristic of the mesothelae, and one far more noticeable than the positioning of the spinnerets, is the presence of several armour plates called tergites on the opisthosoma, which for spiders is a plesiomorphic trait, and one that is only fully retained by the mesothelae, as almost all other spiders have lost any vestige of these segmented plates. These ancient spiders are ambush predators, inhabiting deep burrows covered by a well-camouflaged lid, with numerous trip lines radiating from the entrance that alert the spider to the presence and location of potential prey wandering around outside. The mesothelae account for only a minute portion of the world's spider species, consisting of a single living family, the Lephistiidae, which contains a little over a hundred species, all found in Asia. In addition to these extant mesothelae, a fossil species, Paleothelae montcoensis, has been found in France, in deposits dating to the Upper Carboniferous approximately 300 million years ago. The opisthothelae, in stark contrast to the mesothelae, are extremely diverse and widespread, and comprise the massive majority of spider species, including all Australian spiders. The prefix opistho, as mentioned in the episode covering spider anatomy, means rear, so it follows pretty much without saying that the name opisthothelae refers to the fact that, unlike the mesothelae, these spiders have spinnerets situated more towards the rear of the opisthosoma. The opisthothelae in turn are split into two infraorders, the mygalomorphy and the araniomorphy. Let's start by taking a look at the former. The mygalomorphy are most commonly referred to as the primitive spiders, or ancient spiders, names that would be rather more fitting for the mesothelae. The name mygalomorphy means shrew form, likely alluding to the fact that the large, stocky build and hairy appearance of many mygalomorphs may cause them to bear a passing resemblance to a small rodent, especially if you should have gone to Specsavers. Some of the most familiar mygalomorphs are tarantulas, funnel-web spiders, and trapdoor spiders. Of the two major groups within the opisthothelae, the mygalomorphy retain a greater number of basal traits. Like the mesothelae, their fangs are oriented in a paraxial manner, meaning they are held in a roughly parallel orientation, and when the spider bites, they strike downwards. Mygalomorphs also possess two pairs of book lungs, as do the mesothelae, as well as some of the more basal members of the araniomorphy. For mygalomorphs, the book lungs are their only means of respiration, which limits their oxygen intake and reduces their activity. Consequently, mygalomorphs are largely restricted to a lifestyle of ambush predation, as, while they are capable of immense speed and power in short bursts, sustained activity is almost completely off-limits. In spite of these supposed shortcomings, the mygalomorphs are incredibly formidable predators, and include the largest spiders in the world, such as South America's Theraphosa species, the number one reason I laugh whenever people talk about how big Australian spiders are. Think Aussie spiders are big? Champ, you haven't seen nothing yet. Mygalomorphs also hold the record for longevity in spiders, and this time the record holder is indeed Australian. An individual of Gyus philosus, a large trapdoor spider from Western Australia, lived for an astonishing 43 years. And what's more, the spider didn't even die of old age, but was killed by a wasp. While most mygalomorphs don't quite approach that degree of longevity, it is fairly typical for females to live for well over a decade. 
The Mygalomorphi are divided into two clades, the Atopoidea and the Avicularoidea. The Atopoidea are a small group of bizarre spiders that mostly occur in Asia, Europe and North America. Like the Mesothelae, these spiders possess tergites on the dorsal surface of the opisthosoma, although they are nowhere near as pronounced. Some members of this clade, such as those in the genera Atypus and Calamata, have elongated fangs that can be moved in a similar manner to the forelimbs of a mantis. In certain species, these disproportionately large fangs are used in a unique and highly effective ambush attack, in which the spider waits for prey to crawl over its camouflaged, tube-like web, before moving beneath the unwary victim and skewering it through the webbing, allowing the spider to capture prey without even needing to leave the safety of its shelter. You know, I pick on funnel webs a lot for being slow, fat and lazy, but in their defence, at least they can be bothered to leave their burrows to get food. Now let's take a look at the Avicularoidea, which make up the majority of the Mygalomorphs, and include pretty much all of the group's most familiar members. All Australian Mygalomorphs belong to this clade. The Avicularoidea completely lack tergites on the opisthosoma, which sets them apart from their sister clade, the Atopoidea, as well as the more distantly related Mesothelae. Having now covered the Mygalomorphy, let's move to the other major grouping within the Opisthothelae, the Araniomorphy, which comprise the vast majority of spider species. The Araniomorphy are often referred to as the true spiders, this name is, however, rather misleading, due to the implication that the other spider groups aren't actually spiders, which is not the case. The Mygalomorphi and Mesothelae are still grouped within the order Araniae and are therefore spiders. Another common name often used for the Araniomorphi is typical spiders, which is much more appropriate as nearly all of the spiders that most people would be encountering in their daily lives, such as orb weavers, jumping spiders and huntsmen, belong to this group. The Araniomorphi are the most derived of the three major spider groups, possessing numerous features absent in the Mygalomorphi and Mesothelae. A well-known synapomorphy that is perhaps the most often used characteristic to distinguish araniomorphs is the orientation of the fangs. Unlike mygalomorphs and mesothelae which possess paraxial fangs, the fangs of araniomorphs are diaxial, pointing inwards towards one another and moving in a pincer-like motion when the spider bites. Most araniomorphs also have a more derived respiratory system when compared to other spiders, a dual system consisting not only of book lungs but trachea, which are tubes that transport gases to and from the animal's tissue. With the exception of the most basal members of the group, such as the family Hypochilidae, the araniomorphs possess only a single pair of book lungs as opposed to two pairs. The trachea are thought to have been modified from the posterior pair of book lungs, with the anterior pair retaining their form. Some araniomorphs breathe solely via trachea, though most utilise book lungs as well. This more sophisticated respiratory system means the araniomorphs aren't as constrained as their more basal relatives when it comes to activity. And while mygalomorphs and mesothelae are pretty much universally restricted to ambush predation, araniomorphs are incredibly diverse in their habits and behaviours. Araniomorphs also utilise silk in far more advanced and varied ways than the more basal spider groups, especially when it comes to prey capture. For the mygalomorphi and mesothelae, the role of silk in hunting doesn't extend much beyond trip lines that alert them to the movements of potential prey. On the contrary, the araniomorphi exhibit an astounding diversity of fascinating uses for silk to aid in capturing prey. From the intricate and complex webs of orb weavers, 
to the sticky lasso used by bolas spiders. In spite of their advantages over their more basal counterparts, araniomorphs do fall short of them in a few regards. In terms of longevity, most araniomorphs reach a mere fraction of the lifespans that mesothelae and mygalomorphy can attain, with many species living for only a year or so. The largest mygalomorphs, especially tarantulas, also possess a level of brute strength well beyond that of any araniomorphs, allowing them to dispatch big and potentially dangerous prey with relative ease, a near impossible feat for most araniomorphs without the aid of a web. Araniomorphs were traditionally divided into two major clades, the haplogynae and the entelogynae. However, the status of the haplogynae as a clade has been largely refuted by recent studies, which found that many spiders classified within the group were more closely related to ones outside the group than they were to other haplogynes. The vast majority of the araniomorphy belong to a clade called the entelogynae, united by synapomorphies primarily associated with the female reproductive system. One such characteristic is the epigynum, a hardened plate that covers the reproductive opening of females. Furthermore, in non entelogyne spiders, only a single reproductive opening is present on the females. So both the insertion of sperm and the release of fertilised eggs occur through this opening. In entelogyne spiders, there are two additional openings through which sperm enters, with eggs being released in the same manner as other spiders. Unlike the haplogynae, which are now regarded as a rather informal grouping as opposed to a clade, phylogenetic studies show strong support for the monophyly of the entelogynae. So that concludes this video as well as the guide's introductory episodes. Next time, I'll be starting the guide proper, beginning with the tent spiders from the subfamily Chiatophorinae. If you enjoy this video, then feel free to subscribe and check out some of my other uploads. Let me know what you thought in the comments section as well. So thank you all very much for watching. That's it from me. I shall see you again very soon.